It's Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Watching television, watching television. A dynamite place to be. Dynamite! Sponsored by Vandalay Industries, importers and exporters of fine latex products since 1992. And now, the man who taught Frank Burns how to eat worms, here's your host, Phil Kahn. And thank you, John Meany, wherever you are. Welcome to the latest edition of Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Today's guest is an iconic television game show host, producer, radio disc jockey, and so much more. One of my favorite celebrities, Winston Conrad Martindale, better known to the world as Wink, took time out of his hectic schedule recently to chat with me about a number of interesting topics, including his radio and TV career, production company, and his longtime friendship with the king of rock and roll himself, Elvis Presley. I even had a chance to talk to Wink's lovely bride of 43 years, Sandy, a woman who just happened to date a young Elvis for six years, about 20 years before she met Wink. Let's listen together to my very interesting interview with the Martindales. Hi, Wink. It's an honor and a privilege to have you on the show today. Thank you, Phil. My pleasure to be with you. I'll obviously want to talk to you today about your career in radio and television. You've been an icon for years and years. But first, I want to speak to you about a more recent endeavor. Uh, as you know, this morning you sent me a link to a YouTube video in which you performed your patriotic anthem, a moving and powerful recitation called I Stand for Everyone. And I have to admit, it really brought me to tears. It was so powerful. Can you tell me more about this anthem, please? Yeah. I Stand for Everyone was written about 15 years ago by a songwriter, a friend of ours named Paul Hampton. Okay. Paul has written a lot of hits for a lot of singers. He wrote Sea of Heartbreak for Don Gibson and uh, Raul Donner's You Don't Know What You've Got Till You Lose It. They come immediately to mind. And he also collaborated with a great lyricist, Hal David, on uh, a whole group of songs. But we've known Paul for years, and we were together recently, and he sat at my piano and played and recited the words to I Stand for Everyone, and it just blew me away. It's, it, it hit me as strong or stronger than the first time I ever heard Deck of Cards. Yes. And uh, I uh, am proud to say that last Saturday night, I delivered this at an event at the Reagan Library. Oh, wow. And, and then uh, next February, I'll be joining Lee Greenwood at Miralago for an event where I'll be reciting I Stand for Everyone uh, for that audience, for the president. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to that. But it's, uh, it's, it, I think it's a pretty powerful fe- piece of material, and since we've been talking about it, why don't uh, we present the version that I did uh, on Mike Huckabee's show uh, just a few weeks ago, okay? Absolutely. Now more than ever before, it's time to close the divide in our country, to underscore just what we stand for. Every day I hear my father's voice say, the footprints we make are the stands that we take to bring our country together. I am the flag of our country. This is truly who I am. And when you pledge allegiance to me, remember the things for which I stand. I stand in reverence to the power above me. Stand for the underdog whose dream comes true. I stand to honor a great performance. Stand in awe of love in bloom. I stand for that kind of ambition that's a blessing and a curse. I stand for speaking strictly from the heart, for better or worse. But first, I stand for those whose time was spent 
before they could spend their time. I stand for everyone who lost their place in line. Oh, I stand for kissing and a whole lot of hugging. Stand for the woulda bins had they held on. I stand for givers who know no limits. Stand in hope when hope is gone. I stand for the things you won't say when you don't want to hurt a friend. I stand for living life as if it will never end. But first, I stand for us who put our trust in the hands of God's design. I stand for everyone who lost their place in line. I stand for everyone who's felt the turn of the screw. For those who know rejection is just another point of view. I've saved a place in line for everybody still chasing their dreams. Or so it seems. I stand for the bold and the daring who spun out on Dead Man's Curve. I stand in lieu of everybody who deserves to be heard. But first, I stand for those whose time was spent before they could spend their time. I stand for everyone. I stand for everyone. I stand for everyone who lost their place in line. Wow, that was absolutely terrific, Wink. Gives me goosebumps. Well done. And and, and by the way, uh, Phil, if I might mention, it's available for downloading at winkmartindale.com. Now, you also sent me a link this morning to an appearance you and your lovely bride of 43 years, Sandy, made. You mentioned you were on uh, Mike Huckabee's television program. You also brought up a subject of Something that happened to you in 1954 when you were the morning man at WHBK Radio in Memphis. Now, a young singer, I don't quite recall his name, <laughs> showed up at the station. Can you share with us what happened that day? And, of course, I'm joking. I certainly know the person we're talking about, but I'm just being a little silly. Yeah, I, uh, I was the morning man at WHBQ Radio in Memphis uh, in the 50s, and uh, I happened to... Uh, be at uh, WHBQ Radio uh, one night in July of 1954, showing some of my buddies from my hometown, Jackson, Tennessee, around the station. Mm -hmm. And I heard a commotion coming out of the uh, studio where Dewey Phillips did a show called Red Hot and Blue. In those days, uh, black music was uh, being played more and more for white teenagers. They were getting into what we called then race music, rhythm and blues music. And... Uh, Again, this was 1954, and I went into Dewey Phillips' control room, and Sam Phillips had walked in with a record that he had just cut that day with his truck driver named Elvis Presley. And, uh, Dewey, and Dewey Phillips put it on the radio. He played it uh, seven times in a row. It was called That's All Right, Mama, first thing Elvis ever recorded. And uh, the switchboard lit up, and uh, I happened to be the one designated to call Gladys and Vernon, Elvis' mom and dad, to find out where Elvis was, because Dewey Phillips wanted him to come down to the radio station uh, and hear about this record and uh, meet this guy named Elvis. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Presley said, well, Wink, they were listening at home when they were excited about the reaction to the record. She said, uh, Wink, he was so nervous about his record being tested on the radio that he went to see a double he's at the Suzor's Theater. Okay. And so they got in their truck and they went out and found him in the theater, sitting there all by himself, and whispered to him about the excitement being generated by That's All Right Mama. And uh, they brought him down to the radio station, and uh, he walked into the control room that night. I'm the only living person who was there of the six uh, that night in the control room. There was Dewey Phillips, Sam Phillips, uh, Elvis, Gladys, and Vernon, and me. And everybody's gone except me. Aww. But I met him that night, and he became my friend and was my friend until the day he died. Yes, he passed away in 1977. 
that was the beginning that night in February in uh, July of fifty four. That was the beginning of Presley Mania, and wow. music was never quite the same after that. No, it wasn't. He really shook up the world with his uh, musical style. And I know, as you mentioned, he had a lot of influence from from black uh, musicians of the day. Now, the interesting thing from your interview on the Mike Huckabee show is that your wife actually dated Elvis for six years. But uh, but you won out in the end, actually, as a uh, as you took her hand in marriage. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do you one better. I'm gonna let her tell you about that. Oh, are you? Oh, terrific! She's sta- she's standing right here with me. Oh, terrific! Come here a minute, sweetheart. <laughs> yeah, she dated Elvis for six years. We came at Elvis from two completely different directions. Me in Memphis in '54. Yeah. And her dad owned a bunch of nightclubs out here in Los Angeles, and uh, Elvis used to, and his boys used to come to the club. So here's Sandy, and she'll tell you how uh, her dating Elvis came about. Sandy, say hello to Phil Kahn. Hello, Phil. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. We were just talking about the first time that Wink met Elvis, and he had sent me a link earlier this morning to your appearance on Governor Mike Huckabee's show. And I said, I thought a cute little side story was the fact that you had dated Elvis for six years before uh, connecting with Wink. How did that come about? Yeah, you know, Wink and Elvis knew each other for 10 years before I met either one of them. So oh, that's so funny. It's Yeah, it's a small world kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was at my, uh, I was at home, I was like 14 years old at the time, and I get this phone call from my dad's club, and he had, Elvis saw my picture in my dad's office and said, who's that? And he said, that's my daughter, and he said, oh, I'd like to meet her. Mm-hmm. And so my dad, of course, calls me at home. And uh, puts Elvis on the phone, and he said, hi, I'd like to meet you. Can you come up to the club? Well, of course, it was a school night, and there was no way my mother was driving me up to the club. Uh-huh. So they, this happened two or three times, and then the last time he called and said, uh, can you come up to the club? I'll be here next Thursday. And I said, okay. So I asked my mom, and in the meantime, my dad had come home and said, oh, he's a lovely young man. He's He's very attractive. He's so nice, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So my mom drove me to the club. He had a date with a beautiful actress. I had on a little frilly dress and my hair in a ponytail. And he held my hand and he kissed me on the cheek. And I just sat there and stared at him because he was, he was very attractive. Indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> then he called uh, a week later and said uh, he wanted to date me. And my mom said, no, my daughter can't date you. She's only 14 years old. Yeah. And he said, well... You can come on the dates. So my mom came on the first three dates. He was living at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel at the time. He had just gotten out of the Army and was here to do GI Blues. And um, after the first three dates, and, you know, we'd eat pizza, we'd dance, we'd watch television. uh, And my mom saw what a nice young man he was. He promised my mom that he would be a gentleman and take good care of me. And for the next six years, he did exactly that. And so I'd wait for a date with him instead of going out with the boys at school because I had such a good time with him, and we danced. And I mean, we just had a great time together. Had you met Wink during the six years, or did you meet Wink afterwards? No, no. I, in fact, I have a picture of Wink on a set of G.I. Blues with Elvis. That he, it's Wink's picture. Yeah. And I said, oh, my gosh. You, I mean, I didn't meet Wink until the 1970, 71. Oh. Yeah. Wink had gone through uh, a divorce, and he and his buddy, uh, Wink was doing a, a commercial, I think, for General Telephone. And, you know, it's just, you know, t- luck and timing in life is, is an amazing thing, how just by chance and just by moments yeah. can change your whole life. So I was asked to drive the booze cart at the Music Industries Golf Tournament, and that's where people like Jimmy Bowen, who produced a lot of Sinatra's records and was married to Keeley Smith, uh-huh. and uh, all these guys in the record business had to consume a shot of whatever they drank at every hole because they had to be equally drunk by the <laughs> end of the tournament. And they had a great time. But So they asked me if I'd come down and do that, and I said, well... Okay, but I thought, I'm not going to go down there by myself with all those guys. So I was in my early 20s then, so my mom said she would uh, ask my girlfriend to come with me. So my girlfriend said, Terry Brown, her name was, she said she'd come with me. And her uncle uh, is was Les Brown, the band of renown. Sure. And her dad was Warren Brown, and he was with MCA Music. So she knew everybody in the music business. Mm-hmm. So the two of us go to Palm Springs, 
and we're sitting in Gene Autry's hotel in the coffee shop. It was called the Sombrero Room, having breakfast. And Wink and his buddy, this guy by the name of Mike Schmidt, walked by the coffee shop. They were going to check out and see what girls were out by the pool. And my <laughs> girlfriend my girlfriend said, there's Wink Martindale. And I said, no way, that guy's too young and too cute. I said, Wink Martindale's an old married man with a lot of kids because I grew up watching I'd come home from school and watch his dance party show on television. He was like the local Dick Clark at that time. Right. And uh, from Pacific Ocean Park. So uh, she said, no, I think that's Wink. Well, then they had no luck at the pool, came back by the coffee shop, and my girlfriend Terry goes, hi, Wink. And, And he goes, oh, hi, Terry. So he and his buddy came over. I talked to his friend. He talked to my girlfriend Terry. And 20 minutes later, they they nice meeting you, goodbye, they left. Oh. And um, it was uh, two weeks later, he called Terry for my phone number, and then she called me and said, you'll never guess who called me for your phone number. And I said, who? And she said, Wink Martin. And I said, Wink, you're, ca-. I mean, he, pardon the pun, he didn't wink nothing. He didn't flirt. Yeah, he didn't even talk he to you. He was very shy because he was like recently through a divorce. So he wasn't like, you know, a, a Casanova kind of playboy type. He was very shy. And um, then he called and we had a date. And it was a double. It was supposed to be a double date because his best buddy Bill Smith, who was on the KGIL radio with him, got fogged in in Catalina. Mm-hmm. So he said uh, to the girl, to his girlfriend at the time, they they were married forty some years too. Uh, she, uh, we celebrate the anniversary of our first date at the Chart House. Me, Karen Smith, and Wink Martindale, because he brought her for moral support because he wasn't good at socializing with uh, girls on a date. Wow. As well as he talked on the radio, he was shy when it came to uh, girls. Isn't that interesting? I, I think it's that, uh, that way with a lot of radio personalities and TV personalities. They feel comfortable in front of the camera or in front of the microphone, mm-hmm. but when they interact with, with people, they are shy. Right, right. And so Wink was very shy. So, But it all worked out well, and we've been together ever since. And uh, so we're married 43 years, and we dated for three or four years prior to that. And when I was a little girl, what I prayed for is somebody that I could grow old with. And Aww. God gave me a wink, and we grew old together. Well, you're blessed to, to be together. Now, one little side note to that is that I saw on the TV show where you said Elvis was a really great kisser, um, even better than Wink. George Klein always asked me that on um, Sirius Satellite Radio, the Elvis channel. Yeah. And yes. My standard answer to that question is, Elvis was the best kisser. Well, that's basically what we did. We would kiss for hours. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to go to school the next morning, and he would shave really close, but the hole around my mouth would be red and kind (laughs) of raw from all from all the hours of kissing. So yes, Wink was the best uh, Wink uh, Wink is the best husband. Elvis was the best kisser, but I got the best husband when I got Wink and that's why we're we're best friends and we love each other more today than we did the day we got married. Oh, what a lovely story. Thank you so much for sharing it, Sandy. My pleasure. I'm going to give you back to Winky now. Nice meeting you, Phil. <laughs> Bye. You as well. Bye now. Hey Phil, me again. Yeah, hi, you again. Wow, what a great story that is. That that was terrific. I was so glad you put her on. Now, we had talked about a little bit about your radio career. I want to go back to the beginning. How and when and where did your fascination and love of the medium start? Well, I always wanted to be on the radio from the time I was old enough to know what a microphone was. I think I must have been seven or eight years old. Hmm. And uh, I was practicing on uh, how to be a radio announcer when I was about that age because my dad used to get a annual subscription to Life magazine mm-hmm. <clears throat> from his boss every Christmas. And uh, I grew up reading Life magazine, the pictorial. Mm. And I used to I used to uh, pretend I was on the radio. What I'd do is I would tear the advertisement pages out of Life magazine. I'd go into the back bedroom of this little house we lived in in Jackson, Tennessee, and I'd close the door, and I would uh, pretend I was on the radio, uh, and I would ad lib around these advertisement pages as if I would do it, was doing a commercial. Yeah. And I used and I used to take the newspaper and pretend I was reading the news and I'd read the news. So I became proficient at reading. I always took pride in my reading. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when uh, my Sunday school teacher, who happened to be the manager of the local radio station, asked me to come up 
for an audition one night because I bugged him to death. Keeps saying, you know, Chick, when are you going to give me? His name was Chick Wingate. When are you going to give me a job? When are you going to give me a job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he took me up one night when I ran into him downtown. And he sat me down in front of a microphone, and little did he know I'd been practicing since I was about nine or ten years old yeah. on how to do commercials and news. Sure. He gave me a couple of commercials to read and some news copy from the AP wire, and I went through those like Grant going through Richmond, and he was pretty surprised. He said, man, that, that was good. He said, yeah. you come down here tomorrow. You come down here tomorrow after school, and I'll have the mayor here. The mayor happened to own the radio station. He said, we'll do the same thing for him, and if he likes what he hears, why, we'll hire you. So the mayor came down. I couldn't wait to get out of school that day. I uh, went down to the radio station. I did the same thing I'd done the night before. I was hired at 25 bucks a week, and that was my beginning in radio. Wow, 25 bucks a week. I hope you didn't spend yeah. it all in one place. <laughs> yeah, now I'm, now, now I'm up to 45 bucks a week. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's more than <laughs> I make. But <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about the transition you made from radio and TV. You know, you're perhaps best known for your long and storied career as a TV game show host, including your signature show, uh, Tic-Tac-Toe, along with Gambit, High Rollers, Debt, and many, many others. Before you talk about that, though, I want to first congratulate you on the 40th anniversary of Tic-Tac-Toe. I had a chance to catch the videos you posted recently on Facebook where you recreated uh -huh. the set and played a few games. I got a real charge out of that. That was so much fun. You must have had a lot of fun doing that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was real fun. Yeah, I, a lot of laughter, and I encourage everybody to go on Facebook and, and do a search. I'll also post a link to it again on my uh, my Facebook page and website so folks can watch that. But tell me, how how and when did you have the chance to jump from radio? I know you didn't leave radio, but when you had a chance to first do TV. Yeah, well, I had done uh, my first TV shows in Memphis when I was a kid. I did a teenage dance party show. I was sort of the Dick Clark of Memphis in those days when American Bandstand was so popular. Yeah. And then in 1959, RKO transferred me from Los Angeles, from uh, Memphis to L.A. And uh, I came out here, and out here meaning Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and went to work at KHJ, their station in L.A. And uh, then I went to several other stations, uh, KRLA, KFWB, which was the number one rock station. And I was there for a number of years. And about 1965, 66, I decided, well, actually, I, I, I became addicted to a game show called Password with Alan Ludden. I used to rush home after I got off the air in the morning at KFWB just to watch Password, which came on at noon. Mm -hmm. And I did some research on Password and Alan Ludden, and I discovered that he went in one, twice a week, knocked out ten shows, and the other five days he played golf. And I said, man, that's not a bad way to make a buck. That's a nice living right there. Yes, yeah, so I asked my agent to send me on a couple of auditions uh, as, you know, to try out as a host of a game show. Yeah. And on the second or third audition I went on, I got it. And it was a local show on KTLA in Los Angeles called What's the Name of That Song, which oh. became What's, What's This Song at NBC. And I, it was my first network game show. It only lasted a year, but it launched me into game shows. And, and uh, here it's uh, a number of years later, and I've done either produced or hosted 21 different game shows over the years. Wow. Was Tic-Tac-Doe your favorite? Yeah, Tic Tac Doe was my favorite because it gave me my uh, longest term of employment. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and that's how you base your favorites, huh? How, how long they would employ you. Yeah, plus I love I love the show and everybody seemed to love it too. Oh, it, it was terrific. Now, in addition to game shows, uh, I may take about, about a half an hour to go over your list here of all the other stuff you've done. In addition to radio and TV, you've recorded albums. You mentioned earlier Deck of Cards, which hit number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, selling more than a million copies. You were you acted in a futuristic documentary. You formed your own production company, as you mentioned, Wink Martindale Enterprises. You've written books. You've done commercials. And as a matter of fact, the, the cutest thing I saw, I went to your website today. You even have your own soft drink. Wink Martindale's Rocket Fizz Soda. So tell me some more about all these extracurricular activities. You certainly have no shortage of things to do. Well, there's not much to say. You know, the, the fact that uh, you've, you've mentioned most of them, when you're in this business and you enjoy some modicum of success, these things seem to come your way. And like deck of cards, uh, I had met Randy Wood, founder of Dot Records, when I was in Memphis. And uh, when I came to L.A. in 1959, that summer, we went into a studio and recorded this uh, 
semi-religious uh, narration that had been popular right after World War II called Deck of Cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came out uh, that summer of 59, and that was when Mac the Knife with Bobby Darren was huge and Venus by Frankie Avalon, and I thought, who's... Teenagers buy records. Who's going to buy a deck of cards? Mm. You know, a, a semi-religious talking record. Sure. So, uh, but sure enough, it came out, and uh, several a couple of months later, uh, we got a call from Boston. Uh, they ordered ten thousand of my records. Some J, uh, DJ Bob Clayton, number one morning man in Boston, happened to put it on the air one morning and played it, and the switchboard lit up, and it just started in Boston and swept the nation. That's and by November, I was invited to come to New York and do it on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was then still the number one variety show on CBS. And so um, I got to do it on the Ed Sullivan Show, and, you know, that's just an example of uh, the lucky uh, things uh, that have happened to me. I feel very blessed because I've had so many good things happen to me over the years. So what would you consider the highlight of your career, Wink? Was it in 2006 when you received the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, or was there some other highlight? Or I'm sure there are many highlights, but what's uh, your number one accomplishment, would you say? Well, I, I, it'd be, it would really be hard for me to name one because, like I said, I've been blessed with so many good things over the years that have happened to me. But the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2006 would certainly be one of them. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I was also inducted into the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame uh, in the initial class about five years ago, and of course that was an honor. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess being on the Ed Sullivan Show was quite a thing, because uh, I grew up watching the Ed Sullivan Show every Sunday night, and it was almost like an out-of-body experience to be standing on the stage that later uh, David Letterman would uh, would, would uh, do his show on in that same studio. Um, but... Uh, I think my first network game show, What's This Song, that was quite a thrill to yeah. to be on a network show for the first time. So it's hard to name just one because there have been so many nice things happened to me. Well, isn't that nice? I'm, I'm glad that was your answer. I'm glad yeah. you couldn't narrow it down because you have been blessed with so many things. Which leads me to my final question. As if you haven't already done enough, I want to know, what's next for Wink Martindale? What haven't you done that maybe you want to do or do over again? or what, What's going on next? Well, I've uh, just recorded a, uh, a new narrative recording. Uh, I recorded uh, the one that uh, you played earlier. Yes. Uh, I stand for everyone. And after that, I came across a piece of material uh, related to Elvis Presley. Uh, most unusual. It hasn't uh, been released yet. It will be released during the Christmas holidays. And uh, I won't talk a lot about it right now, but it is just terrific. And it's it's a different approach to Elvis that I'd never heard before. It's uh, in somewhat of a biblical sense. Oh. And uh, it's it's just terrific. So I've done that, and that'll be out during the holidays. Right. And then I also have uh, a couple of shows in development that I'm hoping to sell for television, two game shows, one uh, uh, that I'm especially uh, uh, excited about called Money Maze, M-A-Z-E, mm -hmm. and uh, it's for nighttime uh, network television. Great. And uh, then uh, I have another show called Home Free, where if you win for, for a week in a row, you can pay off. We, we, we pay off a person's mortgage. So um, I had somebody just ask me the other day, do you ever think about retiring? <laughs> and I steal, I steal a line from Art Linkletter. Art Linkletter, when somebody asked him that one time, he said, retire from what? Hell, I'm not tired. And that's the way I feel. <laughs> I love it. That is so funny. <laughs> so, I, so I just keep going. You just keep it. That's so terrific. And the world has been blessed to have you on it. I I don't want to gush too much, but uh, you, you've been a hero and icon of mine for many years. And I can't believe I've had this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much. And I wish you nothing but the best of luck in the future, Wink. Thank you, Phil. You're obviously a man of extremely good taste. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much, Phil. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and your listeners. And uh, God bless you. God bless you, too, Wink. I'd like to thank today's guests, Wink and Sandy Martindale, for a highly entertaining chat. Winker, may you never tire, because none of us want you to retire. Best wishes to you and Sandy. Watching television, watching television. 
We hope you've had a dynamite time listening to this edition of Bill's Pop Culture Podcast. Join us again next time for another stroll down memory lane. Until then, let's be careful out there.